Today on Inside the Issues, I speak to Terry Mitchell and Jose Aylwin on the topic of Indigenous rights and global governance. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsi School of International Affairs. And I'm very happy to be this week's guest host. Every week, we welcome an expert in international public policy, global governance, or some other aspect of international affairs to the studio here at the Centre for International Governance Innovation. Today, we have two guests, uh, and I welcome Terry Mitchell. Uh, Terry Mitchell is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology in the Faculty of Science at Wilfrid Laurier University. She is director of the Laurier Indigenous Health and Social Justice Research Group. Her research focuses on the impacts of colonial trauma, Aboriginal rights, and governance issues. Joining her is uh, Jose Elwin, who's a human rights lawyer from Chile, uh, specializing in Indigenous peoples and citizens' rights in Latin America. He is currently the acting co-director of Citizens Watch, an NGO uh, that promotes the protection of human rights in Chile. Welcome to you both. Thank you. You're both part of a major new multidisciplinary research project on the internationalization of Indigenous rights uh, and governance. Um, Dr. Mitchell, I'll start with you. Could you say a little bit about the project, uh, what inspired it, uh, who's involved, what you hope to accomplish with it? Okay, thank you. Well, global governance is an issue for over 350 million Indigenous peoples around the world. They are some of the most oppressed and uh, oppressed and socially economic challenged peoples of the world with uh, often identified as stateless people who um, are the youngest and fastest growing populations as well with the least access to governance and to policy, that the policies which govern them. So this project arises at a time when, a historical moment when we have Canadian apologies, Australian apologies to Aboriginal peoples in 2008 and the emergence of the UN Declaration on the rights for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples <coughs> in 2007, which Canada and Australia then signed on in 2010. So this is um, a very recent innovation in world governance and an opportunity for us to look um, together, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, on how we'll move together into the future. So the project um, was to look at this historical moment and to invite historians, polyscience, community psychologists, economists, a diverse group of people who've been spending many, many years looking at these issues to come together to address this issue of what is the opportunity and to have both indigenous and non-indigenous scholars come together. What our hope is is that we can understand more about the internationalization, to understand more about the opportunities, about how indigenous peoples throughout the last few hundred years have been working on these issues, but at this particular moment in time, what is the potential that we may hold governments accountable to a right standard that can advance the cultural, um, cultural survival and the human rights of Indigenous peoples. Excellent. And Jose, you're also involved with the, the project. Um, what is your role with, uh, with this study? Well, we, we basically uh, we're invited to uh, by uh, Wilfred Laurier and the network in, in Canada to, to be part of this initiative um, to build an, a network, which in fact it's a network uh, w which existed in, in, in the context of Latin America. So we built uh, a network w with uh, um, universities in, in Chile, Argentina and Bolivia, um, which have been working on issues of a uh, uh, global governance and indigenous rights, uh, uh, also I involving NGOs which have been uh, central uh, uh, to these regards, and and of course in involving um, uh, Aboriginal peoples. Uh, the reality of indigenous peoples in the context of Latin America is in very, in many ways, very similar to to that of Canada, 50 million uh, out of a total population of 500 mi million, and there. The, the patterns of exclusion, of marginalization, are common to other contexts of the world. However, uh, in Latin America, there's growing movements that, that have uh, uh, mobilized indigenous peoples, and, and there's some contexts where they have um, been able to um, uh, participate in, in, in 
state uh, entities. Uh, we have included explicitly Bolivia, where uh, after a long uh, historical process, uh, the indigenous peoples have uh, been able to uh, um, to uh, become a part of uh, the Bolivian government. The Bol Bolivian head of state is a, is an Aymara himself, and and uh, there's legal progress and, and there's political. Uh, progress uh, with regard to the recognition of indigenous rights. Wonderful, and I understand it's it's you know, project is is still very much in the, the early stages. Um, do you have any sense of what the findings might be, or, or or where the research might take you? Well, we're really looking at um, you know to what degree are indigenous peoples now. Um, around the world, but in, in our particular focus now is the North-South, but we also have links in the Circumpolar North, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, but we're building our partnership North-South at the moment as the focus. But in all of those cases, we're looking at trying to assess to what degree are Indigenous peoples aware of and uptaking these international documents and, and programs and policies. Uh, what are the challenges and what are the best practices? What are the successes? So like Bolivia taking it up in their constitution, this is a success and we want to see how is this kind of engagement working in different places. Clearly that's not where we are in Canada, so looking at the variances. So we're doing some comparisons. Then we would look at the global impacts and as, um, as you know, in a global economy, it will be very critical for us as settlers to understand how we will relate into the future with indigenous peoples through a global governance framework through these that are now um, very much expressed through as legal frameworks that are rights-based. So our, our hope is that we will move towards developing um, greater understanding and if we are able to pursue this longer and have the funding within our partnerships we'll not only do the comparative studies but we'll begin to develop kind of a globalization where we'll take international global principles and look at how they're being implemented and uptake at the local level and, the, and look at the successes and the challenges in those so that we begin to develop some kind of uh, greater understanding and practice on the implementation of rights. So the implementation of global frameworks at a local level. And to, to trade and share the information back and forth around successes. Would you say that's sort of where we're going? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, the, the global framework of human rights um, concerning indigenous peoples has, has been increasingly um, uh, uh, um, accepted in, uh, by, by states, um, north and south. Uh, however, there's conflicting trends, and, and, and largely those conflicting trends deal with the globalization of markets. And, uh, and um, the, the globalization of markets, uh, uh, North and South too, but particularly in the Southern context, has uh, resulted in the proliferation of a, um, large extractive uh, or productive industries, which are uh, mainly um, I affecting indigenous territories. It's where resources are located, and uh, so we want to research, um, we do research on, on how um, states are uh, implementing, for instance, uh, um, uh, rights de dealing with uh, um, with uh, land and, and resources and, and uh, rights uh, of indigenous peoples related to. Uh, make th their own decisions uh, uh, with regards to development and right to self-determination, which is part of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We also want to empower indigenous scholars, uh, which are um, um, increasingly um, um, becoming part of, uh, of uh, um, research um, university programs, uh, uh, both no north and south. Uh, um, so th those are some of our challenges as a project. Right. Thank you very much. We'll be back in a moment with Dr. Mitchell, Mitchell and Mr. Aylwin. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, YouTube. Welcome back. Um, I'd like to shift the focus of uh, our discussion a little bit to the history of Indigenous rights uh, as an international issue. Um, the rights of Indigenous 
People's first became a, a major issue at the UN in the 1970s. 1982, there was the establishment of the Working Group on Indigenous Peoples. Um, what prompted the UN to take up this issue? Uh, what are the main controversies? Um, how have experiences varied throughout the world, uh, but protect, potentially uh, with a particular focus on the Americas? And uh, how does your research fit into this larger history of the issue of the internationalization of indigenous rights? Uh, so perhaps, Owen, I'll start with Mr. Owen, I'll start with you. Y yes, well, of course, uh, there's a long history of, uh, by which indigenous peoples have asserted their, their rights at first at the domestic level, uh, on many occasions without success, and when, when indigenous peoples asserted their rights at the domestic level and didn't find a response from states, uh, they searched for global instances. Uh, they even uh, uh, they have taken their cases uh, to global uh, entities since the beginning of uh, uh, the 20th century. Uh, it was actually interesting to mention in this territory the Haudenosaunee leader. Uh, who took, uh, who was the first leader to uh, go to um, the League of Nations in, in the 1920s, and, and and then Maori leaders took took their cases uh, to the to League of Nations. But th then the, the UN was created in, in the 40s, and and when the UN was created, th there was no um, uh, room for indigenous peoples. It was. Uh, 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 Peoples converted into states; uh, those that were, that were invited, and uh, initially, indigenous peoples were treated by the UN system or uh, dealt with uh, as uh, uh, minorities. And in fact, uh, there's many contexts of the world where indigenous peoples are not minorities. Uh, in the context of Latin America, uh, uh, states such as Guatemala and Bolivia—they're the vast majority um, of the population. Then the, the, the UN acknowledged uh, uh, or dealt with uh, uh, indigenous peoples as populations, uh, not acknowledging their collective uh, status. And uh, the, the, the UN Working Group uh, on uh, Indigenous Populations was created in, in the 80s. And, and that opened a space for a revision of uh, assimilationist policies and assimilationist treatment by law. Uh, and, and by policies uh, from states all over the world. And uh, the fact that this uh, uh, working group uh, um, met a, a number of indigenous leaders annually uh, where they could take their grievances uh, was very relevant. Uh, that, that led, um, uh, the interestingly, the ILO, the International Labor Organization in, in the 80s, to revise f former co convention dealing with uh, indigenous population into a convention, which is Convention 169, which is the first international treaty uh, concerning the indigenous uh, uh, peoples, uh, and acknowledging uh, them as such, and acknowledging their political, mm -hmm. territorial, and cultural rights. Uh, uh, so this was a, a big change from the patterns of assimilation and in integration, which had been uh, initially promoted by uh, the, the, the ILO and, and by states with regards to indigenous peoples. And of course, one of the mandates of the UN Working Group was uh, the elaboration of some guidelines uh, uh, with regards to the, these uh, s s considered populations. Uh, it was not clear at that moment what those guidelines would be converted in, but finally it, um, uh, there was a consensus that at this stage of the evolution of the UN, it should be a declaration. So it took 20 years or, or more, uh, actually 25 years, uh, mm -hmm. to have this t UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to, to be approved. And as uh, James Sanaya, who's a, uh, a legal scholar and uh, uh, an indigenous uh, person and, and is uh, currently the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, uh, affirmed, it, it's, uh, the, the process by which the declaration was approved uh, changed uh, uh, the way in which uh, international uh, law uh, has been elaborated at the UN level because it allowed, it enabled, it was a consequence of the participation, the active participation and involvement of, 
of indigenous peoples. So there's been, uh, I mean, a big, big uh, change in, in, uh, in, in the international framework uh, concerning indigenous peoples. And there's been an inclusion of indigenous peoples in a, in a UN system which initially did, did not leave space for them. So um, where are the gaps in policy and practice? And perhaps you know, we can relate this back to the, the larger research project. Um, you know, where, where, are, where are the holes in the, in the international system right now? Well, um, of course, uh, the, 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 the declaration is um, Declaration, first of all, it's relevant to say that s some states, including Canada, four states initially, um, um, did not uh, adhere to the declaration and it took several years for them after 2007, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada and the US to adhere to, to, to this declaration and uh, uh, Canada did it in 2010, as, as, as Terry was saying. Uh, but now there, there's uh, so there's uh, a global adherence to this uh, uh, declaration, but, um, but 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 some states do not consider it as a binding as a legally binding instrument. Uh, um, there's many arguments to affirm that that th this is uh, a legally binding instrument. So in, in fact, uh, Article 42 of the declaration um, affirms that. Not only the UN uh, organs and treaty bodies have to uh, promote a full respect and implementation, but also states have to uh, uh, fully implement and, and promote uh, the rights uh, uh, acknowledged in, in the declaration. Moreover, um, there's elements to uh, affirm that, that rights uh, in considered and included in the declaration uh, are an uh, international customary uh, law uh, because they, they uh, include principles which have been acknowledged by, step, by states both domestically and internationally on other uh, legally binding instruments. Mo moreover, uh, there's several there's jurisprudence by treaty bodies such as a Committee on the Elimination on, of on Racial Discrimination, the Human Rights Committee, uh, that, have, ha con that considers uh, rights of the declaration as legally binding rights and, and whenever states uh, are examined by these bodies uh, uh, they will uh, be requested to uh, and they will be uh, um, um, uh, required to fulfill uh, the rights of a, of a, uh, uh, that, that are considered in, in the UN declaration. So there's many elements to, to consider this uh, declaration as a legally binding instrument. However, as we know, states do not always uh, fulfill and implement uh, these uh, rights uh, because they have conflicting interests. And one of them, which is relevant to the Canadian context, is it, uh, um, the expansion of uh, uh, large investments on indigenous territories. Great. We'll be right back uh, in a moment uh, with Dr. Mitchell and, and Mr. Aylwin. Uh, you're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Um, Dr. Mitchell, this research project that uh, is underway, is a unique partnership among a, a diverse set of actors. And I wonder if you could um, comment a little bit on who's, in, uh, specifically on who's involved and, and what they're, they're adding to the research. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, as you know, we're on indigenous territory. We're on the Six Nations territory. This is an indigenous issue, but it's also a settler issue. It's one in which uh, settlers have a responsibility to look at our history and about how we create a uh, moving into coexistence. But so in this partnership, it, I think one of the very positive strengths of it is it's both Indigenous and non-Indigenous and that it is interdisciplinary. So we have formed, uh, as we're moving through the work, we're growing, but we've formalized our partnership with Six Nations Polytechnic 
and the president Rebecca Jamison sits on um, sits on our kind of board for this work and the planning on the research team, but has signed um, an agreement between Six Nations Polytechnic, between uh, CG, and between Laurier. So we have a formal institutional partnership agreement that will go forward on research on this issue. So we are expanding and looking for and supporting, as Jose was saying, indigenous scholarship within this and looking for the indigenization of the issue, that this is ultimately about self-determination, that it's, there's an opportunity for allies and collaboration, for responsibility of settlers in collaboration with indigenous peoples. So we're bringing on more and more to the degree that we can, inviting to have voice and leadership from uh, indigenous scholars such as Jeff Korntassel and Yvonne Boyer and Pam Palmiter, who uh, will be consulting with us in a meeting on May 31st, and um, just a growing group of um, academics. But we started off with a small group, which was Six Nations um, Polytechnic and Rick Hill, which is the um, indigenous the director of the Indigenous Knowledge Center, and with Darren Thomas there. But in particular, um, in terms of the indigenous interdisciplinarity. We have Ken Coates as a leading historian and Jorge Hein from here at CG and Will Coleman in governance on, on the Belsailly School. Jean Becker as a senior advisor on Aboriginal initiatives at Laurier and um, Alex Lada who has um, been working, at, he's at Laurier, he's been working in Chile. So we had uh, started with a group of scholars with a long-term interest including Rhoda Hasman Howard who's a, a human rights specialist. We started with a small group. Now we've gone to 27 academics across 13 disciplines, eight universities in Canada, four universities in South America. So it's growing and we have now as senior advisors, uh, Right Honorable Paul Martin and Rudolf Stovenhagen, the past special rapporteur on in uh, indigenous rights at the UN. So it's a growing group. Wonderful, and, and just to, um uh, and bring it back to our, our previous discussion. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the, the really important developments internationally is the Universal Periodic Review, which uh, Jose, you touched on uh, before, and this, this evolution of international uh, customary law. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about that process and how it's relevant to this issue of internationalization of indigenous issues, uh, indigenous rights. Well, I'll just start and then give that back to Jose, mm -hmm. but to say that <clears throat> the, the issues that we're addressing are aspirational, but they have some legal teeth and it's taken um, hundreds of years and, and then these evolutions in the last 20 or 30 years of indigenous leadership around indigenous self-determination and Daskahe from here in Six Nations has been very involved from the, the very beginning. So from 1923 going to the League of Nations. So around nationhood and nation-to-nation -nation negotiations and internationalization, Six Nations has taken great leadership all the way through here. But what your earlier question around how are we seeing the strengths of that? What we've seen is a lot of weaknesses. We've seen in principle and words like aspirational. So the gap between policy and practice is enormous at this time. We have declaration, but we don't have processes for implementation. So that's what we intend to focus on, and we see that others are focusing on that. In the United Kingdom right now, um, they're just um, the Middlesex Law School has just come out with a document called Making Free Prior and Informed Consent a Reality, Indigenous Peoples and the Extractive Industries. So there are parallel things going on internationally. But the, the gap between what states see as aspirational and what is indigenous people see as their right and their needs for cultural survival and, <coughs> and international expressions of rights is still huge. And in fact, the uh, and seen as selective. And rather than consent, we're looking at consultation. And rather than something that needs to be applied universally, it's seen as selective by nations. And our own Prime Minister has, for the last several months, denied the Special Rapporteur, uh, James Anaya, entry into Canada in his role as the UN Rapporteur. However, as of yesterday, it was announced that he has been given permission. So we might look at that um, and discuss that as, does the internationalization, do the global frameworks have a role? And are they beginning to show successes in these international rights frameworks. And that's where 
Oh, Jose can talk about UPR. Yes, well, obviously, uh, I mean, the implementation of the declaration is a gradual process to which we want to contribute from a research perspective. But what we're, we're um, seeing in the international, both in the international and uh, at the domestic uh, level, I is that there's an increasing uh, acceptance uh, and uh, inclusion of, uh, of the rights of uh, the UN Declaration as uh, enforceable rights. Uh, at, at the international level, I was referring to treaty bodies and how uh, uh, they, they have been including uh, rights of, of, of the declaration. Uh, <coughs> uh, and, and at the UPR, at the Human Rights Council, the Ex Universal Periodic Review examined states uh, uh, on not only on, uh, on conventions, but, but also on, on declarations, on voluntary commitments. And, and uh, so this is part of what um, the UN and the Inter-American Human Rights uh, System uh, has uh, acknowledged as the corpus juris or the legal corpus of international law concerning uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, so uh, that has a, a, a huge implications at, at the international levels and one of them was that uh, to which uh, Terry was referring to. At the domestic level, there's a very interesting uh, process in uh, particularly in Latin America uh, that w we could identify as a domestication process of the UN Declaration both by their, their inclusion in domestic uh, legal order and by jurisprudence uh, of uh, uh, constitutional courts and, and tribunals. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with Dr. Mitchell and Mr. Ilwin. Uh, you're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. I'd like to uh, conclude our discussion by coming back to an issue that uh, uh, we raised in the last session, which was this question of extractive industries and indigenous rights and uh, the notion of free, prior, and informed consent or uh, related to this, we have the Ruggie principles on corporate social responsibility, which talk about uh, protect, uh, respect, and remedy for uh, human rights violations of corporate actors. Uh, the intersection between extractive, the extractive industries and indigenous rights is is so huge, and I wonder if 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 you could both you know talk about uh, where you know the. The governance challenges are with this, with respect to this particular question involving Indigenous peoples. So, Dr. Mitchell, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you. I think this is a huge issue. I think this is um, in Indigenous territorial and cultural rights in an age of global economy and the globalization of the economy, in, in, in particular economies which are increasingly resource extraction based that there are opportunities for tremendous conflict between settlers and indigenous peoples. There are tremendous opportunities for economic wealth and for the benefit of all the peoples. However, these need to be negotiated, they need to be determined, and we need to have an opportunity to understand it from an indigenous perspective, which we have a great um, inability, it seems, to do at this time. So the global economy is a huge issue that needs to be ad to be addressed at this time. Of course, uh, of course this, this is one of the main uh, um, issues w where uh, state policies conflict uh, uh, the UN Declaration and the uh, rights of indigenous peoples and their aspirations. Uh, and it has to do with uh, the right of indigenous peoples to, to determine their own priorities in, in terms of development. And, and states to uh, as an expression of the right to self-determination. And states ha have internationally a big difficulties in, in, in acknowledging the, this principle because uh, they're involved in a strategy to uh, promote a form of development um, which conflicts with indigenous traditions, indigenous cultures. And, um, <coughs> and of course, uh, it is an issue that concerns uh, indigenous peoples internationally and the UN internationally, and, and as you mentioned, the the UN uh, uh, principles uh, on uh, human rights and, and business. And uh, as you probably are aware, uh, 
uh, he ended his mandate, but, uh, but uh, the UN created a, a, a working group on business and human rights. Th this working group ha had um, last week uh, a meeting in, in Toronto with uh, representatives from all over the world. And one of the main issues is uh, how uh, this corpus juris of uh, 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 international law concerning indigenous peoples is, is, uh, uh, is um, uh, accepted and assumed. Uh, how uh, uh, is free prior informed consent? Uh, is it uh, part of the mandate? Or is it part of the corporate social responsibility or not? And, and many of us believe that, that, that uh, business cannot uh, be done without a um, free prior informed consent of the indigenous peoples. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. This has been absolutely uh, fascinating. I've, I've learned a lot. Um, our audience has as well. Uh, thank you to our audience uh, for joining us today and we look forward uh, to join we look forward to having you join us again uh, for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Uh, please do look for us at cgonline.org on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.